Welcome, everybody. Uh, I'm going to be reading from this book. It's the uh, first edition reprint of uh, <clears throat> Alcoholics Anonymous. Um, so just going to start with the forward. We of Alcoholics Anonymous are more than 100 men and women who have recovered from a seemingly hopeless state of mind and body to show other alcoholics precisely how we have recovered is the main purpose of this book. And if you can see, precisely how we recovered is in uh, bold, all caps. <clears throat> so that's the main purpose of the book. Um, <laughs> that's a pretty big deal. So we can see precisely how these uh, 100 men and women uh, recovered from a seemingly hopeless state of mind and body. Um, so this book is important. Um, and this is an all addictions big book study. So anytime we talk about alcohol, uh, you can just replace it with your um, addiction, whatever that might be. This applies to everything I can think of. And uh, of course, there's many 12-step fellowships, OA, uh, you know, and there's one for gamblers, GA, I think, and SA for sex addiction, and what else is there? Of course, all the Al-Anons and um, codependent programs. And anyway, um, as Emotions Anonymous, trying to think, I used to go to an all addictions meeting and uh, there was a lot of representation there from many different fellowships. Um, got to know always program pretty good. Anyway, For them, we hope these pages will prove so convincing that no further authenticate, authentication will be necessary. We think this account of our experiences will help everyone to better understand the alcoholic. Many do not comprehend the, that the alcoholic is a very sick person. You might have heard uh, um, sick getting well, not bad getting good um, so it's not a moral issue it's a sickness it's an illness anyway and besides we are sure that our way of living has its advantages for all so we'll find out what that is the principles the steps same thing practice these principles practice these steps it is important that we remain anonymous because we are too few at present to handle the overwhelming number of personal appeals which may result from this publication. Being mostly business or professional folk, we cannot carry, we cannot well carry on our occupations in such an event. We would like it understood that our alcoholic work is an avocation. When writing or speaking publicly about alcoholism, we urge each of our fellowship to admit, omit his personal name, designating himself instead as a member of Alcoholics Anonymous. Very earnestly, we ask the press also to observe this request, for otherwise we shall be greatly handicapped. We are not an organization in the conventional sense of the word. There are no fees nor dues whatsoever. The only requirement for membership is an honest desire to stop drinking. 
And if you notice in the AA preamble, they removed the word honest. <clears throat> so it's just the desire to stop drinking. I think they figured there's no way to, de to determine if someone's desire is uh, honest or not. But um, anyway, uh, desire to stop drinking. We are not allied with any particular faith, sect, or denomination, nor do we oppose anyone. We simply wish to be helpful to those who are afflicted. We shall be interested to hear from those who are getting results from this book, particularly from those who have commenced work with other alcoholics. We should like to be helpful to such cases. Inquiry by scientific, medical, and religious societies will be welcome. Okay. Well, that's the Alcoholic Foundation, Church Street, Annex Post Box, 658 New York City, Alcoholics Anonymous. Alcoholics Anonymous. Okay. So here we go. The doctor's opinion, if you want to follow along at home, you're in the Roman numerals, but when uh, the first edition came out, it was page one. <clears throat> um, next time I do this, I'll use a regular big book. I got one on the way, a large print. So all I got is this little guy, and I, I don't think I could read it very well. So... <clears throat> Also got this one. Uh, we might get into the uh, that book too, so we'll see. Um, we'll take it one broadcast at a time here. The doctor's opinion: We of Alcoholics Anonymous believe that the reader will be interested in the medical estimate of the plan of recovery described in this book. Convincing testimony must surely come from medical men who have experience with the suffering of our members and have witnessed our return to health. A well-known doctor, chief physician at a nationally prominent hospital specializing in alcoholic and drug addiction gave Alcoholics Anonymous this letter. This is, um, let me get some, uh, oh, no, that'd be right. Um, this is uh, William Duncan Silkworth at Towns Hospital. Um, so here we go. <clears throat> he, he actually doesn't uh, put his name on here in the first edition like he does in the uh, later editions. Probably because he didn't know how this thing was going to go over. And uh, some of his views maybe have been controversial at the time. So uh, to whom it may concern, I have specialized in the treatment of alcoholism for many years. About four years ago, I attained a patient who, though he had been a competent businessman of good earning capacity, was an alcoholic of the type I came to regard as hopeless. In the course of his third treatment, he acquired certain ideas concerning a possible means of recovery. As part of his rehabilitation, he commenced to present his conceptions to other alcoholics, impressing upon them that they may they must do likewise with still others. This has become the basis of a rapidly growing fellowship of these men and their families. This man and over 100 others appear to have recovered. I personally know 30 of these cases who were of the type with whom other methods had failed completely. So it's quite the endorsement. Uh, also, you can see um, he's talking about Bill Wilson. As a part of Bill's rehabilitation, he had to present these ideas contained in this book to other alcoholics. And uh, most importantly, impressing upon them that they must do likewise with others. So um, one alcoholic helping another, carrying the message, passing it on. Uh, you can't keep it unless you give it away. So even 
right in the hospital talking to other drunks in the hospital he emphasized how important it was to uh share this message um which is kind of why I'm doing this anyway continuing on these facts appear to be of extreme medical importance because of the extraordinary possibilities of rapid growth inherent in this group. They may mark the new epoch in the annals of alcoholism. These men may well have a remedy for thousands of such situations. You may rely absolutely on anything they say about themselves. Yours very, uh, very truly yours, and as you can see, let's see, can you see? Very truly yours. Anyway, it's I can't see with my fingers. Oh, oh yeah, I cut myself. Okay. Anyway, name missing, but that's uh, William D. Silkworth, M.D. Okay, pressing on here, the physician who at our request gave us this letter has been kind enough to enlarge upon his views in another statement which follows. In this statement, he confirms what we who have suffered alcoholic torture must believe that the body of the alcoholic is quite as abnormal as his mind. It did not satisfy us to be told that we could not control our drinking just because we were maladjusted to life, that we were in full flight from reality, or we were outright mental defectives. I love, <laughs> I love that. Um, maladjusted to life, full flight from reality, and an outright mental defective. Um, these things were true to some extent. In fact, to a considerable extent with some of us. Uh, but we are sure that our bodies were sickened as well. In our belief, any picture of the alcoholic which leaves out this physical factor is incomplete. The doctor's theory that we have an allergy to alcohol interests us. As lame in our opinion as to its soundness may, of course, mean little. But as ex-alcoholics, we can say that his explanation makes good sense. It explains many things for which we cannot otherwise account. So, what does all that mean? <laughs> um, I'm allergic to cats, unfortunately, because I love cats, but... Um, so let's use that as an example. Uh, that is ob obviously a physical allergy. Um, I, I, I don't think, um, you know, any kind of self-help or uh, just toughen up or, um, you know, willpower. All the stuff it talks about later, later, like, you know, she's such a sweet girl. You'd think he'd quit for her sake and um, maybe switch from this to that, and from hard stuff to beer. Um, anyway, it's, uh, it's a physical allergy to cats. And how does that allergy manifest itself? Well, sneezing, I have a hard time breathing, wheezing, watery eyes, all these things, right? So an allergy to alcohol manifests itself in this phenomenon of craving that he's about to talk, talk about. So it's this whole allergy concept. So I have a physical allergy to alcohol once i start drinking it manifests itself in the phenomenon of craving 
I can't stop once I start. Um, that's why they say one is too many and a thousand is never enough. It's the first drink that gets you drunk. Um, but it is also uh, mental because we're always sober before we pick up that first drink. So we can't blame alcohol for why we uh, started drinking in the first place. Uh, so we'll get into that mental, physical, spiritual. Uh, and it's also a th uh, three-part program. Uh, excuse me. Thanks, folks, for bearing with me here. I'm getting new glasses soon, so I uh, should be able to read a little better. <clears throat> so, yeah, I was saying, uh, chat GPT is my little helper over here if, if I need it. Recovery, unity, and service. And uh, it goes into which each of those means, but. In a nutshell, you know, recovery, 12 steps. Unity is the fellowship and the community. And service is uh, giving back to AA, service work, taking on roles within the group, et cetera. <clears throat> so you can say uh, 12 steps, 12 traditions, and 12 concepts. <clears throat> um, but we won't be getting into traditions and concepts. We're just going to stick to the 12 steps and the recovery. Uh, recovery program outlined in this book. Okay. All right. Sorry, I get sidetracked. Um, okay. Okay, the doctor's theory that we have an allergy to alcohol interests us. As lame in our opinion as to its soundness may, of course, mean little. But as ex-alcoholics, we can say that his explanation makes good sense. It explains many things for which we cannot otherwise account. Though we work our solution, we work out our solution on the spiritual as well as altruistic plane. So that's pretty important. A spiritual and altruistic plane. So altruism is doing things for others without regard for yourself. Selflessness. Um and later on in the book, it says uh, selfishness, self-centeredness, self -centeredness, that we think is the root of our troubles. So it makes sense that we would do the opposite and um, practice altruism. And um, a spiritual plane. So we'll learn what that means. But we're going to stick to the doctor's opinion, which is considered part of the step one readings. So I'm not going to get too far ahead. Uh, <clears throat> we favor hospitalization for the alcoholic who is very jittery or befogged. So if you've ever been to detox, um, I, I had been to detox and then uh, rehab or treatment center or adolescent treatment program, um, blah, blah, blah. So, because uh, maybe I would have been jittery or befogged uh, if I didn't have uh, the, the detox and the, you know, just going cold turkey, as they say. More often than not, it is imperative that a man's brain be cleared before he is approached as he is then a better chance of understanding and accepting what we have to offer. Well, that makes sense. The doctor writes, 
the subject presented in this book seems to me to be of paramount importance to those afflicted with alcoholic addiction. I say this after many years experience as a medical director of one of the oldest hospitals in the country treating alcoholic and drug addiction. Yeah, that's Towns Hospital. Charlie Towns, I think was his name. This is a delicious root beer. Um, excuse me. There was, therefore, a sense of real satisfaction when I was asked to contribute a few words on a subject which is covered in such masterly detail in these pages. We doctors have realized for a long time that some form of moral psychology was of urgent importance to alcoholics. But its application presented difficulties beyond our conception. What with our ultra-modern standards, our scientific approach to everything, we are perhaps not well equipped to apply the powers of good that lie outside our synthetic knowledge. About four years ago, one of the leading contributors to this book came under our care in this hospital, and while here, he acquired some ideas which he put into practical application at once. So I think a lot of that has to do with uh, helping other alcoholics. I think um, he had permission to <clears throat> work with other uh, patients at the hospital that had problems with alcohol. Uh, so he could work, start working his pro this program as he uh, understood it at that time. So later he requested the privilege of being allowed to tell his story to other patients here. And with some misgivings, some misgiving, we consented. <laughs> uh, the cases we have followed though, have been most interesting. In fact, many of them are amazing. The unselfishness of these men. So I think um, A number three is uh, Bill Dotson. Uh, Bill and Bob. Um, and he never drank again after that. So, and they... Uh, you know, he's the man on the bed, so to speak. <clears throat> As we have come to know them, the entire absence of profit motive and their community spirit is indeed inspiring to one who has labored long and wearily in this alcoholic field. They believe in themselves and still more in the power which pulls chronic alcoholics back from the gates of death. Of course, an alcoholic ought to be freed from his physical craving for liquor, and this often requires a definite hospital procedure before psychological measures can be of maximum benefit. Yes, so you gotta can't be having the DTs and um, turn, turning your will and life over the care of God at the same time. I mean, maybe you can, but you might want to take care of that first before you start writing your fourth step. <laughs> um, we believe and so suggested a few years ago that the action of alcohol in these chronic alcoholics is a manifestation of an allergy, that the phenomenon of craving is limited to this class and never occurs in the average temperate drinker. These allergic types can never safely use alcohol in any form at all and once having formed the habit they found they cannot break it once having lost their self-confidence their reliance upon things human their problems pile up on them and become astonishingly difficult to solve so maybe you can relate to that 
Um, so they're talking about, yeah, the phenomenon of craving, uh, which I talked about earlier, which just means they don't understand it, uh, but there's this craving beyond mental control. Uh, some might say beyond human aid. Uh, we'll read later. Dr. Young said, uh, you know, only a spiritual experience or awakening. Uh, I forget his exact language, but um, only a spiritual experience could solve this problem, this phenomenon of craving. Um, they say the first three steps are I can't, he can, I'll let him. Um, so we're, we're talking about the powerlessness now, the unmanageability. We admitted we're powerless over alcohol, dash that our lives have become unmanageable. Um, so our lives are unmanageable, sober. We can see that too. Like I said, you're always sober before you pick up that first drink. So. We need a, a way by which we can live sober. And that's what this book is going to teach us. Uh, so. Frothy emotional appeal seldom suffices the message which can interest and hold these alcoholic people must have depth and weight yeah uh, frothy emotional appeal like people feeling sorry for you and giving you a words of encouragement or I would say even the like the slogans, you know, the the bumper stickers, um, they're not enough. It's not enough just to just to go to meetings. It's not enough just to read the steps off the wall. Uh, it has to have depth and weight. In nearly all cases, their ideals must be grounded in a power greater than themselves if they are to recreate their lives. So there you go. We have to find a power greater than ourselves. And our ideals must be grounded in that power. If we are to recreate our lives, because we just said our lives are unmanageable and we're powerless over alcohol. Uh, we're beyond human aid. <clears throat> so, if any feel that as psychiatrists directing a hospital for alcoholics, we appear somewhat sentimental, let them stand with us a while on the firing line, see the tragedies, the despairing wives, the little children. Let the solvings solving of these problems become a part of their daily work and even even of their sleeping moments and the most cynical will not wonder that we have accepted and encouraged this movement we feel after many years of experience that we have found nothing which has contributed more to the rehabilitation of these men than the altruistic movement now growing up among them so AA is an altruistic movement. Although at this time, what? how many did he say? Uh, I can't remember. <clears throat> well, a hundred, right? So, although I don't think it was really a hundred. I think it was less. And there was uh, like one lady I believe, and her her stories in the in the back of this uh, first edition called the feminine victory. Okay, 
So anyway, <clears throat> excuse me. Men and women drink essentially because they like the effect produced by alcohol. The sensation is so elusive. While they admit it's injurious, they cannot, after a time, differentiate the true from the false. To them, their alcoholic life seems the only normal one. They are restless, irritable, and discontented unless they can again experience the sense of ease and comfort, which comes at once by taking a few drinks. Drinks which they see others taking with impunity after they have succumbed to the desire again, as so many do, and the phenomenon of craving develops, they pass through the well-known stages of a spree, emerging remorseful with a firm resolution not to drink again. This is repeated over and over, and unless this person can experience an entire psychic change, there is very little hope of his recovery. Okay, let's break that down. Men and women drink essentially because they like the effect produced by alcohol. Yes, we like to get shit-faced, buzzed, blitzed, legless, three sheets to the wind. We like to feel the effect get out of ourselves, not to have to feel, not to have to deal. So that sensation is so elusive that while I admit it's injurious, you know, I could get arrested. My uh, spouse will be pissed or somebody will be mad at me or I'll be, uh, you know, driving drunk or whatever. It's going to hurt you if you do it. You know that. You can't differentiate the true from the false. So when that phenomenon of craving kicks in, boom, reason goes out the window. To them, their alcoholic life seems the only normal one. They are restless, irritable, and discontent. This is before you pick up the first drink. So again, alcohol is our solution. It's the solution to feeling restless, irritable, and discontented. So, uh, again, uh, we have to find a way to live sober and not be restless, irritable, and discontent. And that's what the steps are for. So, they are restless, irritable, and discontent unless they can, again, experience the sense of ease and comfort, which comes at once by taking a few drinks. Boom! Drinks which they see others taking impunity. Why can they get away with it and I can't? Uh, after they have succumbed to the desire again, as so many do in the phenomenon of craving, which we talked about, develops, they pass through the well-known stages of esprit and emerging remorseful, etc. So <clears throat> it's repeated over and over, uh, unless the person can experience an entire psychic change. Well, what's a psychic change? That's also what this book is about. It's it, to enable you to have a psychic change. It's a uh, change your mind. Change, you know, people say my best thinking got me here. So this is to change your best thinking. Uh, some might say uh, to align my will with God's. Thy, thy will, not mine, be done. Um, but we'll get into that. Um, excuse me. Take a sip of my deal. I'm not sponsored by these guys, but I didn't want you to think I was drinking a beer while doing a big book stu study. Okay. <clears throat> so you may uh, hear that restless, irritable, discontent. Uh, so that's worth pointing out. Because we can all relate to that. And the psychic change, uh, it's its an interesting term. On the other hand, and, as, and strange as this may seem to those who do not understand, 
once a psychic change has occurred, the very same person who seemed doomed, who had so many problems he despaired of ever solving them, suddenly finds himself easily able to control his desire for alcohol. The only effort necessary being that required to follow a few simple rules. I think again, we're talking about the steps um, or at least what <clears throat> they had at that time. And the doctor's calling them a few simple rules. And one, one of them, as we uh, already know, is carrying the message. Um, faith without works is dead. So, uh, you know, I remember this. It's a selfish program, and I, I, I don't really know what that means, but I think it has to do with You know, if I don't help others, I can't stay sober. So who knows? <laughs> That's another debate. Is, is it truly alt altruistic if I need to do it so that I can stay sober? I don't know. Anyway. Um, I lost my place again. Okay, got it. <clears throat> few simple rules, right. Men have cried out to me, sincere and despairing appeal. Doctor, I cannot go on like this. I have everything to live for. I must stop, but I cannot. You must help me. Face with this problem, the doctor is honest with himself. He must sometimes feel his own inadequacy. Although he gives all that is in him, it is often not enough. One feels that something more than human power is needed to produce the essential psychic change. There we go. Psychic change again. So he's saying <laughs> that the doctors can't do it. Psychiatrists can't do it. Psychologists can't do it. Your sponsor can't do it. Something more than human power is needed to produce the essential psychic change. So uh, if you're starting this book with me uh, and we're on this journey together, we're all looking for the psychic change. So here we go. We're, we're in for a ride, a fun ride here. Though the aggregate of recoveries resulting from psychiatric effort is considerable. We physicians must admit we have made little impression upon the problem as a whole. Many types do not respond to the ordinary psychological approach. I do not hold with those who believe that alcoholism is entirely a problem of mental control. I have had many men who have had, for example, worked a period of months on some problem or business deal which was way too, excuse me, which was business deal, which was to be settled on a certain date favorably to them. They took a drink a day or so prior to the date, and then the phenomenon of craving at once became paramount to all other interests so that the important appointment was not met. Those men were not drinking to escape. They were drinking to overcome a craving beyond their mental control. There you go. What does that mean? You're drinking against your own will. Again, this is all addiction. So um, your, whatever your addiction is, you're doing it against your own will. You don't want to be doing it. You want to make that appointment. It's going to, it's going to end favorably to you. So you, you want to be there. Uh, 
but you started celebrating a little too soon and didn't make it. Anyway, there are many situations which arise out of the phenomenon of craving which cause men to make the supreme sacrifice rather than continue to fight. Yes. So I assume that means suicide. Um, yeah, because they just can't stop. No matter how much they want to or try or use their willpower. And the doctors can't help them and the, they're what you, you know, what's called in this book, the hopeless variety. The classification of alcoholics seem most difficult and in much detail is outside the scope of this book. There are, of course, the psychopaths who are emotionally unstable. We are all familiar with this type. They're, they're always going on the wagon for keeps. They're over remorseful and make many resolutions, but never a decision. But we're going to make a decision a little bit later on uh, in this study. There is a, the type of man who is unwilling to admit that he cannot take a drink. He plans various ways of drinking. He changes his brand or his environment. There is the type who always believes that after being entirely free from alcohol for a period of time, he can take a drink without danger. There is the manic depressive type who is perhaps the least understood by his friends and about whom a whole chapter could be written. Then there are the types entirely normal in every respect. That would be me. Except in the effect alcohol has upon them. They are often able, intelligent, friendly people. Oh, thank you. All these and many others have one symptom in common. They cannot start drinking without developing the phenomenon of craving. Well, there we go. So it's the phenomenon of craving which sets us apart from the normal drinker, the average temperate drinker. Um, that's what makes an alcoholic phenomenon of craving. This phenomenon, as we have suggested, may be the manifestation of an allergy, which differentiates these people and sets them apart as a distinct entity. It has never been, by any treatment with which we are familiar, permanently eradicated. The only relief we have to suggest is entire abstinence. So, there's no cutting down, limiting drinks, only on the weekends. It's uh, so all or nothing. So, yeah, entire abstinence. This immediately precipitates us into a seething cauldron of debate. Much has been written pro and con, but among physicians, the general opinion seems to be that most chronic alcoholics are doomed. Doomed, I say. What is the solution? I know, like if you're doomed, you want to know what the solution is. Perhaps I can best answer this by relating experience of two years ago, about one year prior to this experience, a man was brought in to be treated for chronic alcoholism. He had but partly recovered from a gastric hemorrhage and seemed to be a case of pathological mental deterioration. He had lost everything worthwhile in life. It was only living, one might say, to drink. He frankly admitted and believed that for him, there was no hope. Following the elimination of alcohol, there was found to be no permanent brain injury. He accepted the plan outlined in this book. Boom. What did he do? He accepted the plan outlined in this book. Alcoholics Anonymous, big book. Boom. 
One year later, he called to see me and I experienced a very strange sensation. So you could ask yourself, uh, am I willing to accept the plan outlined in this book? Um, I knew the man by name and partly recognized his features, but uh, there all resemblance ended. From a trembling, despairing, nervous wreck had emerged a man brimming over with self-reliance and contentment. <laughs> Excuse me. <coughs> oh, boy. Um, a nervous wreck. <laughs> I talked with him for some time, but was not able to bring myself to feel that I had known him before. To me, he was a stranger, and so he left me. More than three years have now passed with no return to alcohol. Unbelievable. When I need a mental uplift, I often think of another case brought in by a physician prominent in New York City. The patient had made his own diagnosis. Well, there you go. It's the only disease where the patient has to diagnose themselves. We admit we're powerless over alcohol, that our lives have become unmanageable. And, and uh, you know, there you go. You're an alcoholic. Um, so anyway, he made his own diagnosis. I think that's important to note anyway. In deciding his situation hopeless, he had, he hit. He, he had, bloop, bloop, sorry, hopeless, had hidden in a deserted barn, determined to die. He was rescued by a searching party and in desperate condition brought to me. Following his physical rehabilitation, he had a talk with me in which he frankly stated that he thought the treatment a waste of effort, unless I could assure him, which no one else had, that in the future, he would have the willpower to resist the impulse to drink. His alcohol problem was so complex and his depression so great that we felt his only hope would be through what we then called moral psychology. And we doubted if even that would have any effect. However, he did become sold on the ideas contained in this book. So he accepted the outline in this book and he became sold on the ideas contained in this book. And what happened? He has not had a drink for more than three years. I see him now and then, and he is as fine a specimen of manhood as one could wish to meet. I earnestly advise every alcoholic to read this book through and through. Oh, through, and though perhaps, excuse me, and though perhaps he came to scoff, he may remain to pray. That's nice. So if you came to laugh, you might end up on your knees praying. Uh, so next time we'll do Bill's story. That's it for today, folks. And uh, we'll be in step one for a little bit. So stay tuned. Thanks a lot. Goodbye. How do I? Oh, there it is. <laughs>